So my name is Aarti. I am from Shell India. I am digital commercial lead, taking care of commercialization of digital products created in Shell in collaboration with several partners. So we have an external ecosystem. And I'm also the open source lead at Shell. And I closely work with Dan Brown, who's sitting in the first row, uh, you know, many others in Linux Foundation Energy. And we, lead, we deeply appreciate what Linux Foundation Energy has been helping Shell with in the context of open source and energy transition. So this is my topic. I'm going to talk about how open source is helping us in our journey of energy transition. And specifically, I'm going to take an example of data platforms data standards and uh, take that as an example and help you understand how open source is really a must and needed for energy transition for the globe and not just for one company like Shell. So that's about my talk. Um, this is our disclaimer slide. So everything has been vetted. So if you hear something about uh, some of the publicly available information, you have all rights to quote it. So yeah, so cool. I want to acknowledge my leaders here, Dan Jeevans, who is our VP for Digital and Computational Science. He's also the decision executive specifically for the open source program. Bryce Bartman, who is our chief digital technology advisor and also the business opportunity manager for our open source program. Hari Ramani, my line manager. He's the GM general manager for digital innovation. Um, Ian Bates, who is the business opportunity manager specifically for data platforms. So. I have four sections in my talk. First, I'll take you through the why, why energy transition and digitalization are intertwined. In the second chapter, I'll talk about how open source plays a role. In the third chapter, I'll specifically talk about the core capabilities in the tool called real-time data ingestion platform that we have open sourced via Linux Foundation Energy. And the last one is about how this has really wide networks of application even beyond energy sector, right? It's, it's beyond energy sector, right? So that's, that's what this talk is about. Since we last about five minutes, I think, I'll try and save that so I have enough time to hear your questions and engage in discussions. So let's go into why. So this, this is a report titled Digital Technology, the Backbone of uh, Net Zero Emissions Future. Uh, it's, a, it's a report uh, driven by MIT Technology Review Insights. Uh, there were about 350 C-suite executives who were interviewed who, who were uh, requested to give uh, inputs to develop this report. It's editorially independent. Shell did not influence this in any way. Shell has participated, though. So you can see our VP, Dan Jeevans, has participated in this report. So um, what's, what's, what's behind this, right? So. Why am I bringing this? It's a very recent report. Just a few months ago, it came out. Um, it, it, it has addressed inputs from nine industry leaders. Um, as I said, 350 C-suite uh, executives, digital technology, chief advisors, chief uh, data officers, uh, chief information officers, you know, um, all, all the very senior level executives of many industry sectors. And there are about eight sectors that have participated. So energy, mining, metals, transportation, uh, petrochemical manufacturing, industrial manufacturing, uh, construction, retail. Uh, all these sectors have participated in providing inputs. And geographically, it's spread across North America, Asia Pacific, and Europe. It's not restricted to one location in, in the global context. And um, to give a bit more uh, views on what what is the demographics of this, about 30% uh, of the respondents are from North America. About 50% of the respondents uh, are coming from the industry whose revenue is in the range of 1 to 10 billion. And about 30% of respondents uh, correspond to the industry whose revenue cross or uh, it's beyond you know 10 million. 10 billion. Um, yeah, so. So it's a very, you know, uh, unbiased and highly covered, um, you know, uh, report. I must say. So given that background, what is the outcome of this report, right? So let's look at it. So the report clearly found out that these eight different industry sectors have their own different ways and scales of how they how they work on uh, sorry decarbonization and how they are um, you know, evolving in this journey of decarbonization. 
definitely, uh, you know, they have their own uh, uh, players and they have their own favorites when it comes to levers for decarbonization. Digital is one of the most fastest and arguably one of the cheapest lever for decarbonization. While I'm not standing here advocating for digitalization alone, but it, it was found in this report that digitalization is one of the um, you know, best leverage uh, that we should take into account for decarbonization. So that's, that's what it found. And um, this is where uh, it, it becomes even more pertinent for, you know, the climate goals of this planet. So what are we doing as an energy company, right? So um, needless to say, we, we need unusual partnerships. We need, um, you know, boundaryless ways of working and partnering with external people. When I say external, external to Shell. Um, <coughs> this, this is where Linux Foundation Energy has helped Shell enormously to partner with many other companies. And um, you know this. This is an, a clear example of open innovation and op open ecosystem needs, which is connected to how digital can help in decarbonization, and that's where open source comes in. So with that, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, let's let's address why energy transition and uh, digitalization are intertwined, right? So as you can see on the blue side, you have mostly technology-driven aspects. On the red side, which is energy transition, it's all, all related to non-technological related aspects, including political, commercial, operational aspects, right? So needless to say, um, you know, these, these two are intertwined in their own manner. Um, if, if we want to decarbonize the entire value chain of a particular energy system, digitalization has shown up enormous you know, benefits, whether it's about uh, the operational efficiency or CO2 emissions uh, or how they, are how they are dependent on each other, digitalization has played a big role. And we can think through digitalization in context of data and AI, right? I mean, digitalization is a very broad word, so we can go a lit little bit more specific. And AI and data, they provide the mechanisms and tools to what we call as you know, reduction of overall CO2 emissions, and how they do is by overall optimizing the energy system. And AI and data has also provided this um, powerful way of you know, coming up with entirely new low carbon um, energy footprint systems, for example, um, you know, coordinated power systems, um, decentralized energy systems, Beat any any of these two examples. I mean, it has made it a lot more coordinated, a lot more flexible when it comes to consumption of energy. It has also made overall um, better in terms of efficiency, and in not just in the power sector. In in you know whether it's a highly decentralized but networked um, you know sectors. You know, for example, aviation fuels. Uh, carbon s sequestration and storage and hydrogen, digitalization has become very, very relevant for us. And in Shell, initially, um, so I joined Shell 16 years ago. Um, initially, we used to sell digitalization to people. Now we see everybody working on digitalization, be it business, be it technology, be it finance, functional organizations. We see everybody having digital expertise sitting in the organization. So it's not anymore a centralized team, but even the skills and the culture has been decentralized, right? So I, I hope this explains how these two are intertwined. Um, the next aspect is the integrated aspect, right? So energy system is not of one kind. We, we have multiple energy systems. We have uh, traditional refineries. Now, even for traditional refineries, example in Germany, um, we are using renewable energy as a, as a means to produce energy to run the refinery. So we, we have installed a very high megawatt uh, pro proton electrolyte system to generate clean hydrogen, which is further used in the Germany refinery called Rheinland. I mean, if you look at this, they are integrated in one way or other, be it hydrogen, solar, um, electric vehicle charging, road transport, uh, conventional uh, oil and gas assets, the CCS, they, they are not independent anymore. They have a lot of interdependency. So this is one of the 
other layer that we can go. So we so far talked about energy transition and digitalization. This is an, another layer of um, you know, um, importance where digitalization clearly adds tangible values. And if we want to do an optimization and integration at the system level, you can't do it without digitalization. And if you see data is the equalizer in all of this, you know, if you just take an example time series data, whether it's a solar farm, which is all about how the weather input data is going to affect the overall prediction and intermittence of solar you know, you know, uh, asset performance, or is it a um, hydrogen asset where it's a typical process industry, you have to ha you know, process the real time data of the process values like you know, temperature, velocity, and all of this. It's, it's the time series data that equalizes among all of this, right? It's just one example. It's not the only example, it's just one of the examples. So this is where Shell is doing some fantastic work. So we, we don't look out look outside the world uh, to help us in this. If we see, yes, this is the strategic way we can go ahead. Uh, otherwise, we will not have interoperability between the technologies of these different energy systems. That's where digitalization team comes into play and says, we will govern how the data acts as an equalizer. It's not just about data as in uh, management of data. It's, uh, it's also about data ownership, data mastership, data accuracy. It's, it's everything that's related to data, and hence there's a senior group of leaders in Shell who govern how this data acts as an equalizer and interoperability enabler across this integration of energy systems. So, so I started with why energy transition and why digitalization and how they are intertwined talked about MIT Technology Review Insights Outcome, which is a global study. And I talked about next layer, how as by taking an example of integrated energy system, how digitalization brings that in interoperability. Let me address next how we are going to transform the energy system with all that we have talked so far, right? So here, it's not anymore about technology alone. It's, it's, it's about culture, it's about unusual ways of partnering. It's about uh, going out of traditional barriers, um, you know, uh, having open-ended collaborations where we help each other. And I, I think that's, that's the change that we have seen in the last 10 years, at least in Shell, that, that has really led to the transformation of energy industry. So while technological innovation is core of it, it's not just that alone. It's about how we have moved away from traditional, you know, biggest uh, energy company who has their own secrets and patents to how we have started talking about openly sharing our codes, openly sharing our data standards, because it's not an individual player. Energy transition is a team sport. We need to actually collaborate with our customers, suppliers, system integrators, technology partners in an unusual way, which is really needed for rapidly accelerating this because we don't have a lot of time for reaching our climate goals. So I hope I have addressed the why of it so far. Um, let's go into how aspects, right? So um, open source, I, I mean, this, this is not just how, it's, 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 it's one of the key enablers we see in Shell as, as a means to you know, enable this transformation of our assets into highly optimized and uh, uh, you know, autonomous assets, self-optimizing and autonomous assets that actually talk seamlessly to each other. And even if they're completely from different energy mix, different end of the value chain, how they integ integrate and talk to each other, this is where we really rely on open source as one of the key enabler. Now, I talked a lot about how data is important, how data enables AI. A bit more on, on, on that context. So if, if we look at um, you know, uh, how we do business, it's, it's not about um, you know, having a set of confidential data, working on it within the teams. Even within our e internal ecosystem, we have enough transparency to work seamlessly without any vertical silos in the organization because we can't do proper uh, digital transformation of assets if we can't have a standardization of our data. 
and we we can't do it if we don't manage it if we can't do it if we don't efficiently efficiently process those data in cloud we can't do it if if we don't have reliable reliable data standards across our assets so that's one of the key area where open source becomes very very important whether it's it's related to math behind how we calculate methane emissions or co2 emissions or it's related to how we report it in terms of structure of the data these standards have to be open sourced and that's where shell is going on we 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 just started with one tool called real time data ingestion platform uh, last year in uh, october and november last year but we are already working on 10 different open source projects now so this this is where a data enabling ai is further enhanced by open source the second is culture and learning so shell has got its um, you know a cultural program called shell.ai which has got 15000 internal um, you know community members and it has also reached out to external members we have done 40 hackathons uh, this the same shell.ai program has Uh, a, a residence program called Shell. AI residency program where we bring in talents from MIT, RISE, and uh, Indian universities, European universities, globally in Netherlands, London, uh, Houston, and Bangalore. Specifically, these four locations, we have this two-year program where we take a young talent and nurture the talent, um, learn from the young talent, and also. you know make sure that they are also upskilled in a unique manner via our collaborations with udacity as an example to you know meet these uh, really challenging problems to join the vision of energy transition right and last but not the least the access to talent uh, that's an another place where open source plays a huge role um while we know the problems that we face and we understand it better but there's nothing that stops us from taking help from others uh, outside shell and it's it's not you know right to say any more that we know we will solve it ourselves and we don't want to collaborate that's not going to work and open sourcing has helped us to collaborate with extensively with our partners um we we have left and right many partners coming to us in the context of both open source and commercialization which not only makes our products talk to their products seamlessly but as i said in the previous slides it's it's the global decarbonization strategy and agenda that's that's behind that right it's not about how these individual companies can make more money because they cross sell and upsell their tools together now it's not about that it's about the global agenda of climate goals so in in this context i also want to um, give an another example we we have something called open ai energy initiative um the founding partners are c3.ai baker hughes shell and microsoft so we started this in 2021 and previously before this initiative um specifically for oil and gas customers operators um technology partners in that space there wasn't any marketplace where they can bring their products they can uh, collaborate seamlessly by integrating their products for example c3.ia platform is now integrated with the digital twin platform from kongsberg via this while we are four partners we have enormous number of other partners like kongsberg infosys axelos senesco are all part of this initiative so what are we doing there it's it's not as open as open source but um we have both binding and non binding contracts within this framework wherein we integrate our tools in a meaningful manner and also we also collaborate on open sourcing some of our tools especially the foundational technologies that needs to be open source because the collective success matters so this this is just one example and here um the novelty is there wasn't any such a platform before so now we have several partners who are joining us we have three work streams one on upskilling one on product work stream another on sales work stream um it's it's about working on customer backward strategy and understand feeling the pulse of what they need not focusing on pr press release but actually you know uh understanding customer problems their really really pain points and solve their problems right so this this is one place where <coughs> we didn't have a marketplace till till we created this and uh this year we have made a major refresh on 
how we are driving this, how we are upskilling each of us. For example, something that Microsoft has already done in a very, very good fashion in, in, in the context of cloud infrastructure. We don't reinvent that wheel in shell. We don't let our partners like C3.ai or Baker Hughes reinvent that wheel. It's a kind of a mutual trust um, you know, oriented a platform where we come and share each of our strengths and we take help from each other. This is just an example of uh, how, how you know, we work in open with other partners. So some of the benefits of this now, because of this, we have got um, enterprise scalability of our tools. Uh, one of the example is uh, predictive maintenance, which is about how reliable the assets are and how predictable their performance is, how safe their performance is. We have scaled from a uh, few hundred equipments to now several thousands of equipments without doing it in a manual fashion. And we are further scaling up. And imagine we have assets, and also the world has assets which are not digitally ready. There are assets that are being digital. There are assets that are doing real digital. There are assets that are not yet even ready for digital. It spans across all of them, and how you scale up your tools, digital tools, is based on uh, the platform help that we got from C3.ai, some of the infrastructure that we got from help from that that we got from Microsoft, and needless to say, it has led to full interoperability. So our technology works seamlessly. The digital twin tool of Kongsberg, the platform from C3.ai, and the core heart of it is our you know algorithms, which which comes from the domain expertise of shell engineers they all talk to each other in a seamless fashion. And it's not just a shell. We have also sold this to our external customers, Galp, Adnoc, Chevron, um, Petronas, as an example. So you know, this is, this is all about how you can have an end-to-end -end integrated tool. So that's the last but one point. And also you know, integrated domain-specific solutions. Um, we don't rely on just AI. We, we bring the synergies between AI and physics-based models. So that's one of the things that we have been very successful in scaling up via C3.ai platform and uh, other solutions from Microsoft and Baker Hughes. So let's go to chapter two. Um, so far, I talked about why and gave some examples of how Shell has been working in open, uh, both via open sourcing and via open AI energy initiatives. Um, so this is, uh, as I said, last year we open sourced our tool. Uh, it's called Real-Time Data Ingestion Platform. Uh, it's a tool that we are very proud of. It, it has gone uh, several years of development from America to Australia. And every Shell has said, this is the tool that's working a day and night uh, to you know, produce some of the fantastic valuable results for us, uh, not just on efficiency, but also on carbon footprints, right? So what is this, what is this tool about, right? It's about how we you know, do an efficient way of data ingestion and how we do that in cloud, and also how we provide a user-friendly, um, you know, algorithms and um, additional toolkits along with this heart, heart of this tool called RT Deep to enable any users from world. Just because now that this is open source via Linux Foundation Energy, anybody can now download it. And you will also see how user friendly it is because of some of the Python wrappers that we have already built in. And this is an another example where you can scale across different sectors. I talked about eight sectors from that MIT technology report, transportation, construction, so, so many sectors. Each of these sectors can be benefited via this because it's at the end of the day time series data ingestion platform. It's all about how we efficiently do it, how we structurally do it consistently, and how we act actually also share the results of the data crunching or the data processing to other systems. Um, so this, these are the strategic values. We, we, we have already started to work with um, company partner types called technology partners. For example, C3.a, Kongsberg, Senesco come into that category. Um, we also work with operator customers. Uh, for example, we are now working with the cement industries in India and some of the other global locations, which come under hard to abate sectors. And 
they're struggling a lot when it comes to decarbonization, but using RTDIP, we are helping them to connect the, um, you know, uh, quintessential electrical related technology products, digital products to process engineering products, right? So strategically, you can work seamlessly with other sectors, support integration via this platform. Um, we, we definitely have used it in the context of interoperability. Um, so I mentioned about Kongsberg Digital Twin. How is, how is this and that connected, right? So because this is now ported on C3 platform and it works on C3 platform, and because C3 platform and Digital Twin are integrated, this is also integrated with Digital Twin. So while Digital Twin can help on both the static and the dynamic data, without the connection with RTD, you, you really can't, for example, if you do a machine vision, end-to-end -to -end tool integration for understanding where the problems are in the asset. You can't map the 2D image data to a 3D location of the asset, especially assets are of Olympiad field sizes. That kind of integration is also enabled via you know, how, how we make those tools talk seamlessly to this RT deep, uh, data platform. Um, there are a few other examples. Um, one of the thing is, uh, we, we do not distinguish small operators, small customers, small technology partners, big technology partners. We don't want to do any of those business here. It's a fair share mechanism. Um, irrespective of how small a company or how big a company, each of them have their own visions. So many smaller companies have reached out to us, um, you know, uh, after ex ex experiencing for a few months with RTD, they have come and reached out to us on some collaborations. We have, they have also reached out on some help from our side. So this, this is how we can enable um, you know, decarbonization in my humble view. We, we can't distinguish companies as small, big here. This is not about status game. It's rather about how we can really work towards decarbonization. And, in that context, some of the cement industries that I mentioned, they, they don't make a big revenue, but they make a lot of CO2 and they're polluting our environments. And uh, you know, I, I come from India. India is second largest when it comes to steel, product, steel production and also second largest when it comes to cement production. And we are still a developing country. That means we have enormous needs for cement production in the next few decades, if not centuries. And if we don't tackle these problems, we're not going to decarbonize the world. So that's, that's the agenda behind this. It's not about um, you know, being first, being large here. It's rather about being together and working together in this space to help each other. And it leads to uh, you know, seamless partnerships. That's, that's something that I'll talk about in the last chapter. So some of the tangible value from this real-time data ingestion platform, right? So, um, how we do data utilization today, um, it's, it's not something very uniform. Uh, whether it's weather data, which is a time series data or process data, there's a lot of, um, for the want of a better word, divergence and inconsistency in how we do it. This is one of the areas where this RTD has been extremely useful. We are now working with many power companies who, who wants to collaborate with us, but the base layer will start at the infrastructure layer, starts with RTD and some of the services from Microsoft and C3.ai. On top of that, that company wants to bring their tool and B-Shell wants to bring our tool. With all these um, foundational layers, such as RTD, we are able to make uh, contributions to each other and help each other in, in our decarbonization journey. Um, it's, it's not something where we, we have not thought through um, scale up. Today we are at four trillion in terms of rows of data within Shell. It's, it's a public information available and it's uh, you know, crunching data from three million sensors from Shell assets in total globally. Um, and it's beyond energy, be it power, be it other sectors, food, um, supply chain, industrial manufacturing, any kinds of defense, it, it, it is not um, you know, uh, specific to one sector. So these, these are the tangible uh, values, I must say. I'm not repeating some of the things that I already mentioned. Going to chapter three, which is about core capabilities. So what you have here is 
a very efficient way of how you process time series data in, 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 the, in the cloud. And uh, you start from the streaming points. It could be Event Hub or Kafka. And then you file it into a Delta Lake House, right? And I talked about how users can actually work with this without having much of a knowledge on how it works, right? So that's where Python SDK and REST APIs come. There's not a big difference between Python SDK and REST API. These are meant for different types of users. So the Python SDK enables how the users can interact with the data. So it has got a security layer. It has got um, an, uh, uh, you know, deployment and execution user enablement. Similarly, REST API also does the same thing. It's, it's also about interaction with the data, but it's for two different kinds of users. Now, going into uh, you know, RTD SDK, SDK, as I said, it's, it's, it's all about building, executing, and deploying. has got a fantastic way of how you know, queries can be executed. Um, RTD API is very similar. I suggest you read the documentation. Links are provided here, and my talk has been uploaded in the internet um, open source summit page as well. Now, going into um, how we have applied it for energy transition in Shell, right? So, I talked about three million CSRs working on this, or providing data into this uh, RTD platform, and um, how the you know, scalability is also managed with the four trillion rows of data, all that, but where is it going? What is it doing, right? That could be one of your question. And this is where I want to say it's, it's, it's the right time to think because I request you to go through it, go through the Linux Foundation Energy website and search for RTD. Um, it's, it's not about whether we, we can collaborate in this space, it's about how we collaborate and how we move ahead, right? So I really suggest you guys to join as partners with us. And it's it's not about uh, you know one particular sector, as I have repeated multiple times. It's all about how we can have a world that has seamless foundational technologies. If you want to have a good control of scope one to three emissions and really want to contribute to the climate goals, we can't have thousand tools with different uh, standards which don't talk to each other and each of them competing in the race of climate goals. No, that's not going to help. And of course, if something else works better than RTD, we are happy to move on to it as well. So long, long story short, it's, it's really a request from my side. It's, it's the right time to think bigger in terms of climate goals in the context of sustainability why technology innovation and why interoperability is the key for energy transition. This is just an example, as I say. Data management is just an example. And we consider data as an equalizer because that connects all other sectors. So I already talked about integrated systems, um, a quick reinstating of what I said. We have multiple energy systems from traditional uh, oil and gas to renewable energy. And they, they are not anymore working as individual energy systems. We are doing very big system level optimizations, and digitalization plays a very big role here, just reinstating what I said before. These are some of the specific examples, electrified chemical reactor. So just as this example, right? So steam crackers, we know that they are very energy intensive. You, you can't have a steam cracker without having that very high gigawatts of power generation. And that eventually means you, you are generating a lot of CO2 and polluting the world. Conventionally, it runs chemical reactors are running based on you know, um, supply of fuel, burn the fuel, generate heat, and then use that heat furnaces uh, or what's being behind the scenes, right? Now, imagine if you replace that traditional technology with electrification. If we electrify one steam cracker, it's equivalent to removal of 350,000 cars in Europe uh, road. So can you help? Hello. So I'll continue till then. So that's just an example, right? So, so the other example is systems level modeling, right? So I talked about cement and steel industries. 
Um, traditionally, they, they don't have renewable power in their mix. For example, I quoted Rhineland, Germany example where we have gigawatt uh, level of proton electron, um, you know, electrolyzer which generates renewable hydrogen and use that as the power to run some of the operations in that Rhineland refinery. Imagine the same thing. If the power mix can become renewable in the cement sector, you, you can actually go towards net zero carbon in these hard to abate sectors. But how to do that? How do you install an electrolyzer with all these challenges that we have with intermittency of solar power, intermittency of wind power? That's, that's, that's not something you can solve by working on one system, which is a small. It requires a very different lens scales. At, at the electrolyzer level, you have to do multi-scale modeling, computational models, physics-based models that come into picture. But at the scale of larger integrated systems, and even integrated between different plants and different assets, you will have to do a plant-wide optimization and a plant-wide modeling. And imagine the level of interoperability that you need to make cement plant talk to a solar plant from which it's extracting the power, or a wind, power, wind plant from where it's extracting the power. It's, it's unimaginable how much is the complexity. So this is a one place where we have been extremely benefited by leveraging tools like RTDIP, uh, because we make sure that's, that's at the foundational uh, technology level, and that's how the data is structured, managed, processed, crunched, and shared across these different plants. So you know, we, we just make sure that it's not just for process industry, it's for electrical, it's for every other sectors, right? So when we collaborate with internal or external assets, we make sure that we, we bring in the same uh, open sourced RTD pass our foundational technology so that you know tomorrow we don't have one big problem which doesn't talk to this technology and we don't know how to solve it or we have completely different standards and we are again diverging. Convergence is the only way, and hence, open source helps a lot. The third example is better cooling of our EV batteries. Um, based on our simulations, again, a lot of time series data crunching and physics-based model data crunching, what we have found is uh, our product called Shell E-Fluids is 30% better than the market fluids in cooling batteries, which if they get overheated, can cannot work, can be in danger, and cannot do what they are supposed to do. Now, this has led to a partnership with Kraysel, and they are also now hence using RTDIP. And you know, these, these are some examples. Sustainable aviation fuel. In 2021, we have managed to produce um, synthetic kerosene from carbon dioxide water without any uh, non-renewable feed uh, into the mixture. And we, we have powered the uh, real passenger flight from Amsterdam to Madrid, and it became a huge news. Again, a lot of technology interoperability there. Sorry, can you repeat what that chemical mixture was? Sorry? Can you repeat where the fuel was derived from? So CO2, water, okay. in, in, in presence of electrolyzer, we created a fuel. Yes, but your primary fuel does not have a non-renewable footprint. Yeah, so your net zero carbon is managed there. Because it wasn't extracted. Yes, okay. yes. Thank you. And safe storage and transport of hydrogen. This is the last example. With that, I'll close my talk. Um, this is a fantastic example. We have intensive thermodynamic uh, expertise in Shell. And uh, combining that thermodynamics knowledge with our digital tools such as RTDIP, we, we have struck a very big deal under DOE of US. Um, our project has been selected in uh, creating a large scale uh, uh, manufacturing and transportation of hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, for both green and blue hydrogen. And <coughs> yeah, needless to say, it would, have, it would not have been possible without the digital interoperability and um, you know, all the benefits that we have derived from our partners in this space. Yeah, so with that, I'll open for questions. Uh, okay, a couple questions. Thank you for your talk. Really appreciate it. Um, okay. Uh, you talked a lot about data management. Um, 
is there, and you also talked a lot about uh, improving uh, interoperability. Can you explain a little bit more about why there is such complexity between, um, say, a steel plant and a solar uh, generation? I didn't quite understand where the complex complexity lies. Um, is it in the prediction, or is it in uh, changing the transmission of power and then like adapting. I'm not, I'm not really sure, I'm not a power expert. Sure, no problem. So um, like you said, that cement industry example, it has to talk to the power plant in a digital way um, and also to a wind plant in a digital way. And if the data are not, di are not convergent, if they have different diverging structures, different diverging formats and also how, how they are processed if they have completely different technologies behind it, solving that itself is a big mess. Okay, if they use different standards of communication, you mean? Uh, it's not just communication. It's, okay. it's about how you maintain the structure of the data, how you report it, and how you maintain that as a seamless, uh, uniform uh, format across all assets. And efficiency also, right? You know, if, if you don't know how to crunch the data, you know, if, if you have a hardware sensor that's monitoring the data because it's just yet another sensor present in the asset, it's put in the DCS, it comes to you via a process information system. There are various ways. Aviva has got this OSI PySoft as a tool, for example. At the end of the day, if you don't know how to get that very quickly into the cloud, if you don't know how to do number crunching for that big data in a very efficient way, and if you don't know how to report that in a structured way, uniform structured way, it's not going to be easy. You will lose a lot of time just in processing and doing it. And RTDIP solves that problem? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. Um, you focused a lot on uh, data. Was there specifically data for communication of sensors? Uh, was there anything about um, storage of electricity or operating grids? Like the, there was a slight mention of distributing power and stuff like that. Is there anything about balancing grids or um, maybe more specific to grid operations uh, that, that Shell is working on that, that could yes. improve efficiencies overall? Maybe not so much about like, again, processing and data efficiency, but more about grid operation efficiency and how technologies may yes. help there. Yeah. Yes, so I can't quote the name of the partner we are working with because we haven't signed the contract and it's not yet in public release. But this is an area, again, for hard to abate sector customers. We are partnering with one of the quintessential electric company where you know, they are good in what they are doing. They, they have a fantastic distribution of power networks. They, they are good at doing microgrid simulations, but they do not know how to do the integrated system modeling and how to do that efficiently to provide the help that um, these hard to abate sector customers need. So we, we have a partnership which we are going to sign where Shell will bring in our expertise and our tools, <laughs> which we call as background IP of Shell. They'll bring their background IP. And together, we are a lot more synergistic. And also, like I said, in all these example cases, we steadfast insist on uh, interoperability and having a common foundational layer. How you do data, how you pass data, how you work with the data, how you communicate data, we, we are convinced if we don't have uniformity and diver convergence there, we will not be efficient. So this partnership is also leveraging RTDIP on top of that some of the proprietary tools that we have not open sourced yet, plus system modeling, computational efforts from Shell side, and from their side, they bring in the ex experience and the expertise and tools re related to power. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Hey, weren't you speaking at another one? Yeah, actually, I was in, the, in this room in the morning to start off. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, so you spoke a lot about the role of the open source software that you guys are developing in LF Energy for the optimizing the, the system of an organization, right? Um, which is really useful, and you know, thank, thank you a lot for showing that. I know also within the LF Energy group, there also work on, I believe it's called, 
and I believe this is very important for Shell as a traditional oil and gas company on the carbon data specification, the C, uh, the CDS, yeah. um, which deals, this is coming from their website, uh, dealing with uh, raw data and standards for data requirements that enable energy data access for measurement and tracking carbon emissions from production through to consumer. So in this case, you're not dealing with you know, just optimizing data within a system, but optimizing the, the flow of information across across systems, which for an oil and gas company like, like Shell can be really important. And I wanted to just know if you have any exposure to this work in Elf Energy, anything that Shell is doing on that on that front, which which has to do more with the flow of information across this customer base and supply chain base. It's something I'm personally interested in and would like to hear your thoughts if you Completely, on that. completely resonate. CDS has been in our purview for a long time now. Mm -hmm. We we are considering open sourcing some of our tools related to methane emissions, and it's not very easy. Methane emissions. Imagine wind velocity, um, various other parameters that can actually influence how the data has to be processed. Right then, your baseline correction becomes extremely difficult in these cases. So definitely, we are going to work with Dan Brown and his team on this. So, really good example uh, where uh, you know companies like Shell has to work with uh, Linux Foundation Energy on topics like data specifications. It, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we could talk a bit afterwards because specifically on the point of methane emissions, it's an area sure. we've been focused heavily on our data certification and tracking for oil and gas industry emissions, and we did some prototyping on that. So it'd be sure. interesting to hear what sure, you're thinking. Sure, definitely. And, uh, maybe also explore joining LF Energy as a member. I know there's a certain formality, so I could maybe learn from you. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that Sure, later. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.